for the record, this movie would have been better than the stupid one he was trying to make when he was alive, that's for sure. Maybe not as happy, but definitely better. Story number two about Uncle Mark. Uncle Mark lost the camera, his mother got him. The one who recorded dance battles and gang fights and block parties and the beginning of his corny ass movie on. Couldn't afford another one. Options. Could have asked Grandma again, but that would have been pointless. Could have stolen one, but he wasn't about to be sweating. So he wasn't about to be running. Could have gotten a job, but working was another one of those things Uncle Mark just wasn't about to be doing. So he did what a lot of people do around here. His plan. To sell for one day, one day, Uncle Mark took a corner pocket full of rocks to become Roll's future finance. And in an hour, had enough money to buy a new camera, but decided to stick at it just through the end of the day. That's all, just through the end of the day. I'm sure you know where this is going. He held that corner for a day, for a week, for a month, full out pusher, money making pretty boy, a target for a ruthless young hustler whose name mum can never remember. That guy took the corner from Uncle Mark, snatched it right from under him, and it wasn't peaceful. Everybody ran, ducked, hid, tucked themselves tight, blew their own eardrums, gouged their own eyes, did what they'd all been trained to, pretended like yellow tape was some kind of neighbourhood flag that don't nobody wave but always be flapping in the wind. Uncle Mark should have just bought his camera and shot his stupid movie after the first day. Unfortunately, he never shot nothing ever again. But my father did. Anagram number four, cinema equals Iceman. Random thought number three. Not sure what an Iceman is, but it makes me think of bad dudes, cold-blooded. So anyway, after I said it and shoots, it was like the words came out and at the same time went in went down into me and chewed on everything inside as if I had somehow swallowed my own teeth and they were sharper than I'd ever known. Meanwhile, Uncle Mark reached into his shirt pocket, pulled out two cigarettes. Great, more smoke. I hope the second one wasn't for me. I don't smoke, shit is gross. Plus people who live in, who real, like me, ain't allowed to smoke in elevators. And what happens next in this movie? Uncle Mark asked, tucking one cig behind his ear. Booger rolling the other between his fingers. Nothing, that's it, the end. I shrugged. He positioned the cig in the corner of his mouth, patted his pockets for fire. The end, he murmured, looking at Buck, motioning for a light. It's never the end, Uncle Mark said, all chuckle, chuckle. He leaned towards Buck, never. Buck struck a match and the elevator came to a stop again. This time there was no smoke blocking the door, even though there were three people. I guess people in the elevator smoking. I know it don't make sense, but stay with me. And there he was, clear as day as the door slid open. Recognised him instantly, been waiting for him since I was three. Mickey Holloman, my father. Mikey Holloman, my father. My pop stepped in the elevator, stood right in front of me, stared as if looking at his own reflection, as if he'd stepped into a time machine. Moments later, spread his arms, welcomed me into a lifetime's worth of squeeze. Is it possible for a hug to peel back skin of time, the toughened and raw bits, the irritated and irritating dry spots, parts that bleed? Pop pulled away, noticed his brother, gave Uncle Mark a firm handshake, yanked him in for a half hug, just like on all the pictures. No sound in the elevator except hands popping together and the muted thud of pats on backs. I have no memories of my father. Sean always tried to get me to remember things like pop dressing up as Michael Jackson for Halloween and after trick-or-treating, riding us up and down in this elevator, doing his best moonwalk, but not enough space to go nowhere, slamming into walls. Sean swore I laughed so hard I farted, stunk up the whole elevator, even peed myself. I was only three and I don't remember that. I've always wanted to, but I don't. I so don't. A broken heart killed my dad, that's what my mother always said. And as a kid, I always figured his heart was for real, broken like an arm or a toy or the middle drawer. That's not what Sean said. Sean always said our dad was killed for killing the man who killed our uncle. Said he was at a payphone, probably talking to mom when a guy walked up on him, put pistol to head, asked him if he knew a guy who went by G. Don't know what Pop said, but that was the end of that story. I always used to ask Sean how he knew that, especially the whole G thing. He said Buck told him. 
said that was Buck's corner. It was then that Buck started looking out for Sean, who at the time was only seven. Buck was 16, but I don't remember none of this either. Hi, Will, my father's voice brand new to me, deep, some scratch on the tail of each word. How I figured Sean's would have sounded someday. How you been? Weird talking to my dad like he was a stranger, even though we hugged like family. All right, I guess, I said, unsure of what else to say. How do you small talk your father when dad is a language so foreign that whenever you try to say it, it feels like you've got a third lip and a second tongue? I wanted to unload, just tell him about Sean and how mum cried and drank and scratched herself to sleep, how I was feeling, the rules, all that. wanted to tell him everything in that stuffy elevator, but I held back because Buck, Danny and Uncle Mark were watching with warm, weird faces. I already know, Pop said, taking a deep breath. I know, I know, I know. Sadness and love in his voice. I replied, choking down me, choking up. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know what to do. I wiped my face with the back of my hand, knuckles rolling over my eyes to catch water before it came down. No crying, not in front of Pop, not in front of Danny, not in front of none of these people, not in front of no one, never. What do you think? What you think you should do, he asked. Follow the rules, I said, just like I told everybody else, just like you did. Pop gave Uncle Mark a look when Uncle Mark asked if I'd ever heard of my father's story. Of course, I said. He was killed at a payphone. Worry washed over Pop's face, opened his mouth to speak, but changed his mind and changed his mind again. <clears throat> That's not the story we're talking about. What you know is how I was killed, Pop explained. But you don't know. You just don't know. When Mark was shot, I was shattered, shifted, never the same again, like shards of my own heart, shivering on at me on the inside, just like your mama told you. You and Sean were little and I just couldn't come home and be a daddy and a husband when I couldn't be a brother no more. Not after what happened and how it happened. But I didn't cry, didn't snitch, knew exactly who killed Mark, knew I could get him. The rules. Talk to me by Mark, talk to me by our pop. That night, I walked two blocks to where Mark used to move, where dirt was done, and waited and waited until finally a dude came from a building, stepped up to his corner. Mark's corner slapped a pack in a customer's clutch. Money was exchanged, and I knew that was my guy, the guy that shot my brother dead in the street. I made my move, <clears throat> hood over my head, gun from my waist, and by the time he saw me, I was already squeezing, pop, pop, pop. By the third, he was down, but I gave him one more just because I was angry. So angry, like something had gotten into me. That something that my pop said had gotten into him must be what my mum meant by the night time. Pop said he took off running so fast his sneakers barely touched concrete. Said he took the long way, turning pistol into proof, turned bang, bang into hush, hush. When I got home, I took a hot shower, hot enough to burn the skin off my body, he said. Couldn't kiss your mother, couldn't kiss you boys, good night, just laying naked in the scummy bathtub in the cold porcelain, keeping me from sleep, from nightmares. But you did what you had to, to do, I said, after listening to my father admit what I had already known. The rules are the rules. Uncle Mark and my father looked at me with hollow eyes, dancing somewhere between guilt and grief, which I couldn't make sense of until my father admitted that he had killed the wrong guy. You ain't killed G, I asked, confused. No, I did, Pop confirmed, his voice crumbling, but G didn't kill Mark. G was just some young kid trying to be tough, trying to make a few friends, a few bucks, a flunky for the guy who killed Mark, he explained. Then, then why, then why you kill him, I asked. I didn't know he wasn't the right guy, Pop said, a tremble in his throat. And I was sure that was Mark's killer. Had to be. I leaned against the wall next to Danny, thinking, staring at my father, who wasn't my father at all, at, at least not like I had imagined him, a man who moved with precision, papers, purpose, not no willy-nilly buck bucking off at randoms at random. Spent my whole damn life missing a, a, a miser who that disappointed me. And he stood on the other side of the elevator, staring back at me, wasn't sure what he was thinking. Maybe that I was exactly how he had imagined. Maybe that disappointed him. Random thought number four. There's this thing I used to see kids at the playground do with their dads. They'd stand on their father's feet. The dads holding the kids by the arms, walking stiff leg like zombies. 
The kids had to trust the fathers to guide them because the fathers could see what was coming. But the kids holding tight to their dads moved blindly backwards. Then Pop made the first move, a step forwards. I made the next, then he took another. We met in the middle, again dove into each other. This time the hug, a mix of I miss you and who are you and I'm confused and I'm cracking and I don't know what the hell to do or where the hell to go. My father's hand gripped my back as I did my best to bury myself in his armpit, to get lost in the new and strangely familiar feeling of fatherhood. And that's when it happened. He pulled the gun from my waistband and put it to my head. I freaked out. What are you doing? I shrilled in shock. What the hell are you doing? Eye to eye, a tear streaming down his face. Just one, so it ain't really count. Chest aching like a weight, crushing me, biscuit tight against my temple. He cocked it. Sounded like a door closing. I called out for help, but couldn't see no one. Not Uncle Mark or Danny or Buck or hear them or even smell the dank of tobacco turning to tar. Like it was suddenly just the two of us, me and my dad, both of us apparently losing our minds. Pop stood over me, the gun pressed against the side of my face. It was the first time I'd ever had one to my head. First time I had been that close to death, to the end. And at the hand of Pop. Pop? Pop. You would think I would be thinking about whether or not he could actually do it since he wasn't real. But the hugs were real and the gun was real. There weren't no ghost bullets in that clip. Those were real bullets, 15 total, one for every year of my life. My stomach was aching, the quaking world in the bottom of it, and it wasn't long before I could feel myself splitting apart. A warm sensation ran through the lower half of my body, seeping down my leg into my sneakers. Cigarette smoke cut once again, this time by the smell of my own piss. Then Pop uncorked the gun and cocked the gun, wrapped his arms around me again, squeezed tight like I was some rag doll, stuffed the gun back into my waistband. I screamed, pushed him away, yelled until my throat stripped, until my words became sizzle, weak, wet, worried about looking like a punk-ass punk kid. And my father leaned against the wall, staring, chin up, cocky, quiet, while I exploded. And like old times, Uncle Mark came to his side like a brother, pulled the extra cig, the one tucked behind his ear, handed it to my father, chest heaving. Eyes on me, he threw the cig in his mouth. Buck took his cue, I backed into a corner, wished this stupid elevator would get to L, this whole thing to hurry up and be done. Buck struck a match and the elevator came to a stop. Stranger. Chubby, light skin, almost white, the type that turns red, that browns dirty brown hair curled up on his head. Burns dirty brown hair curled up on his head. Got in the elevator like a normal guy. Didn't acknowledge nobody, no dead body, no live body, no smoke, normal. So I figured he was real, which made me real embarrassed about the pee, but made me real happy I wasn't all the way gone. A thick, pale dude stood staring at his blurry reflection in the metal door, then Buck started trying to get his attention. Yo, Buck said. Psst. Guy didn't budge. Yo, dude. Buck called, reaching for his shoulder. The man turned around. I know you. Buck flashed his big choppy grin. Your name Frick, right? Only to people who know me, know me, the guy said, reluctantly reaching for Buck's hand. Remember me, Buck said, like a distant relative at a reunion. Buck, he said, showing the back of his T-shirt again. Oh, shit, Buck. Head cock buck, arms wide. What's good, man? Nothing is good at all. This is Danny, Mark, Mikey, and you remember Sean. This is his little brother, Will. Before Frick could answer, I asked Buck how he knew him, what his connection was to me, what he was doing in this spooky ass elevator. How do I know him? Buck scoffed, shaking his head. This is the man who murdered me. Wait, 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 wait. Hold up. Hold up, hold the hell on, on my brother, on Sean's name. You serious? Wait, what? Wait, 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 what? You heard me right. See, Frick here, Buck paused. Why they call you that anyway, he asked, sidetrack. It's really Frank. Twin sister, Francis. Frick and Frack came from my uncle, stupid shit old men call you. Stick in the hood, Frick explained. Who are you telling? Matter of fact, because of you. Buck paused again, then turned back to me. Because of him, Will, the only reason people around here know my government name is from reading it on my damn tombstone. Buck's real name was James. 
I've only heard it one time. Buck better than James. Buck short for young Buck. Nickname given by stepfather as a joke because Buck couldn't grow no facial hair. Smooth baby face, nothing rough about it. Buck was two-sided, two dads, step and real. Step raised him, a preacher, a real preacher, not scared of no one, praying for anyone, helping everyone. Real run through him. A bank robber would steal air from the world if he could get his hands on it. People always said he was taught to do good, but doing bad was in his blood. And there's that night time mum always be talking about. It'll, it'll snatch your teaching from you, put a gun in your hand, a grumble in your gut and some sharp in your teeth. But he didn't start that way. First Buck was a small time hustler, dime bags on the corner. Same old story until my pop got popped at the payphone that night. Then he became a big brother to Sean and a robber to a bunch of suburban neighbourhoods every morning. He knew better than to jack people around here and come back with money the most, sneakers the best and jewellery, which he loved to show off. Back to Frick. I was shocked when I heard that this dude killed Buck. Yeah, Buck said, hand on Frick's shoulder, all buddy buddy. This is the guy, he glanced at me. Sean never told you that story. He never really talked about it, I said. Sean just said you were shot and that he knew who did it, I explained, remembering that time. Sean's face, a candle, melted wax, flame flickering out. I remember the cops banging on our door to question him, to tell him they heard he was close to James. That that was the one time I heard Buck's real name. And to ask him if he knew who might have done it, killed him, shot him twice in the stomach in the street. Sean Oates said nothing to the cops, to no one, just locked himself in his room for hours. And the next day I caught him sitting on his bed, pushing bullets into a gun clip. Well, let me tell you, Buck said, we were hanging out at the court, sharing a bottle of something cheap and strong just before it went down. Buck said Sean was telling me how he had gotten into a little scuffle, nothing major, it was one of the dudes from the Dark Suns, Buck said. Said he had to get your mother some kind of soap she uses that he could only get from the store down by where they hang out. Dumb thing to say would have been to tell Buck how important the soap was, that it stopped Mum from scraping loose a river of wounds. But instead, I just said, Riggs. Not sure what his name is, Buck said. Said Sean said he was going to the store when this dude ran up on him talking all this shit. Riggs. Said it was nothing serious, just popping off at the mouth about how he was a dark son and how Sean ain't belong around here. Said Sean was in his feelings, all huff huff, explained to Buck how he had grown up with the kid and how the kid was brand new. Riggs. Buck said he told Sean to let it roll off, but he couldn't because that's just how he was. All emotional all the time, Buck said. While he's going on about this dude, I'm trying to show him this chain I just got from some kid out in the burbs. Didn't even snatch it. I just growled a little bit and asked for it. And the sucker just took it right off and handed it to me. Ain't even snatch it, Buck said, thinking back on that day. Like he still couldn't believe it. But what does that have to do with my brother and this guy? I said, pointing to Frick. Hold on, I'm getting to that. So because Sean was tripping so hard about this dude, I gave him the gold chain. Buck said, proud. A gift, his first one. Then Sean left the basketball court. And that's when I came, Frick chimed in, a big smile on his face like he had just won some kind of award. How to become a dark sun? One, turf. Nine blocks from where I live. Two, the shining. A cigarette burn under the right eye. Three, dark deed. Robbing someone. Beating someone. Or the worst, killing someone. Note, apparently you've also got to be corny. I was assigned to my dark deed for initiation, Frick explained, and it was to kill Buck. No, he said. Funny thing is, I was just supposed to rob him. I didn't think it was a, a funny thing at all. Everybody knew Buck was always flossing, always flashy, but nobody would touch him because of his pops. Both of them real and step. Gangsters always respect older original gangsters, OGs, and preachers who act like gangsters. Frick said his plan was to jack the jack boy, said he knew Buck would be at the court, so he ran up to him, pulled the hammer and got laughed at. Buck said he couldn't get got by a dude who he could tell was as soft as a suburban joker he'd just jacked. Everybody in the elevator laughed, except for me. Whatever man, Frick said, I was just trying to earn my stripes, can't knock me for that. He turned around, caught eyes with 
Pop and Uncle Mark, and they nodded in agreement. No judgment over here, Uncle Mark said, throwing his hands up. Anyway, this crazy fool Buck swings at me, just tries to take me, and even though I had a broomstick, Frick looked at Buck, shook his head, then cut his eyes to me. I got stared, scared, so I pulled the trigger. Buck bent his pinky and ring finger back, turned his hand into a gun. Bang, bang. Again, what does this have to do with Sean, I asked. Sean stuck to the rules, Frick replied. You mean, I swallowed, you mean he, he, I struggled to get it out. Now Buck put the finger gun against Frick's chest and repeated, bang, bang. Actually, he only pulled the trigger once, so it was more like bang, Frick corrected. Fifteen bullets. Took me out before I even got my shining, Frick said, rubbed just under his right eye like it still rubbed him the wrong way. Frick yanked his collar down. See this, he said, exposing a hole in his chest, dime-sized, disgusting, bloody, but not bleeding. Your brother's fingerprints are in there somewhere. Buck had and un replied before I had a chance, and I bet it's his middle finger. When the joke was over, I asked Sean, I asked how Sean could have known Frick was the guy who killed Buck. Buck said there was only one other person at the court that night, always there, all the time. A young kid running back and forth, trying to dunk, not shoot. Said he thinks I might have known him, Tony. And he wasn't trying to dunk, he was trying to fly. Tony talking ain't the same as snitching. Snitching is bumping gums to badges. But Tony ain't run to no cops or cry to no cameras, nothing like that. Tony talking was laying claim, loyalty. An allegiance to the asphalt around here, an attempt to grow taller, get bigger one way or another. Now let me ask you, how you know this kid Riggs got your brother, Buck fired back? Because he clearly got revenge for Sean taking out this guy, I pointed to Frick. Frick, you know a kid named Riggs? Danny asked out of nowhere, her voice floating over my shoulder. Little dude, big mouth, dark son. I figured this description might help. Frick looked at me confused. Who? Anagram number six. I wish I knew an anagram for poser. Frick looked at me like I was crazy, shrugged his shoulders and turned around and faced the door. I couldn't see his reflection. I couldn't see any of their reflections. Just mine blurred. Frick had his own cigarettes and his own matches. Finally, 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 the elevator came to a stop. And I'm going to stop it there for now.